Adjustments here as we get started. Thank you, team. Always, uh, always good time. Really enjoyed the set this morning. Thank you. I forgot, as I usually do, announcements. Melissa has left me a note that says, Please draw their attention to the insert. Uh, I don't know if you know uh, Dan and Rebecca Ludwig, but they are having a baby. Uh, they've been long-term visitors with us from Ethnos 360 Bible Institute, uh, and they are just dear, dear people. Uh, Rebecca has had to go back home for a family emergency, uh, but we'll still plan on having the shower February 20th uh, in her absence, yes? Or, yeah, yeah, we will shower them with baby gifts uh, for baby Ludwig. Does baby Ludwig have a name yet? Chloe. Chloe. Aww. Baby Chloe. That's so exciting. I am so excited, boys. I tell you what, nothing, well, there, there's ne a number of different things I get excited about, but having babies is just great. As long so, as it's not us. As long as it's not us, yeah, we're, we're done. We're done having babies, uh, by the grace of God. But then a couple of different things to, to just pull out here. Uh, February 24th, we're going to have a church game night. This is an opportunity for us as a church family to just come in. It's not, it's not really an exclusive party. It's an inclusive party. So if you've got friends who like to play games, Bring them out, February 24th, a Sunday evening, we'll play games together. Please don't forget Daylight Savings, March 10th, March 10th. So that's this looking to the future. Just don't forget that that's coming up. 
And then um, probably one thing that's not quite on the radar just yet, uh, we're going to do an outreach event in April that I'm personally really excited about. Uh, Luke Brady, our director of outreach, is uh, putting together Archery Tag. And so uh, I am really excited because last year, uh, Rives Baptist had a youth event where they had archery tag, and it was like a month after I had just had shoulder surgery. And so this year, I'm ready to play. Okay? Uh, ish. Awesome. Don't don't expect me to be running around or anything, but I do I do look forward to playing. The kids all have their turn, and then the youth members have their turn. Yes, it's going to be a good time. So let's uh, let's bow before the throne and pray together this morning. Father, um, you're so amazing. It's so amazing how you love us, Lord. It's so amazing that you would send your son to die for us. And so, Father, I just ask as we look into your word this morning, as we do something maybe a little bit different, I, I just pray, Father, that you would be honored and glorified, Lord, that we would lift you up this morning. Praise your name together, Father. Thank you for all that you've given. And, Lord, I just pray for all the needs that we have as a congregation in Christ's name. Amen. I'm going to start off with a short video. <laughs> Sometimes you have to accept the reliable testimony of a wildebeest who's been around for a minute. You know, he knows beyond a shadow of a doubt that is an alligator. And the other wildebeest says, no, you're crazy. That's a law. And so he tries to, he sets, he sets out to prove it and he ends up getting eaten. Well, that's it's no fun for anybody. We're going to be looking today at uh, the book of Acts, chapter 13. Uh, there are no wildebeests here, but uh, there is some... There is a religious idea. You establish it's an alligator by believing the reliable testimony of the first wildebeest. How do you verify the truth of a religious proposition? Well, that, that's an interesting question. You see, in the modern world, a true Christian religious proposition has to come from the Bible, right? I'm going to make a mess already. It's okay. I'm going to make an even later mess later. A true Christian religious proposition has to have its origin somewhere in the Bible. If you just decide to import ideas from anywhere, you're going to get eaten by an alligator because that's just not correct. It's not true. And so you have to have an idea for the Christian faith that comes from the Bible. Now, modern theologians, generally speaking, don't like new ideas. You know, because somebody will look at the Bible and they'll say, no one has ever seen this before. Look, I found the answer. Except they're ignoring the history of the church where many of these new revelations have been found and disproven hundreds of years ago. Christian theology is actually intentionally a little bit stodgy. That's a good thing. We don't want innovative new religious ideas because that leads us into this thing called heresy and heresy is bad. Amen. Thank you. <laughs> and so modern theologians don't really like new ideas. Often these things have been wrestled over before in the past. You can imagine the deity of Christ. Now we as a, a Christian church and a Christian denomination, we believe that Jesus is God. Amen. Yeah, that's something that we believe. But it's been fought over hundreds of years ago, and it created sort of a division between the Jesus is not God people and the Jesus is God people. 
You know what? That keeps resurfacing over and over again because you have people like the Muslims and the uh, Jehovah's Witnesses and Mormons who say Jesus was a very nice man but not really God. You know what they're not using? The Bible. The Bible. And so they are, by definition, unchristian ideas. And so these things have been fought over. And we as Christians believe that this is the completed revelation of God. There's no, okay, this is it. From, from Genesis to maps, this is it. This is what God has given us. And the challenge for us is to understand the difference between the alligators and the logs here. Now, in the ancient world, and we, we've been talking a lot about the first century. You know, the first century, the birth of the church, the book of Acts, where this was not yet completed. And so how would you verify the truth of a religious proposition if you didn't have this complete and set in your hands? Well, there's a number. I'm glad you asked that question. It's a great question. <laughs> One of the things is that in order to believe a message had come from God, it had to come a certain way. It had to come through a person who was an accepted messenger, a prophet. So in the Old Testament, you look back, so we'll just skip back to the Old Testament, Moses. Was Moses a prophet of God? Yes. And so the writings of Moses have made it into the Christian canon as part of the Bible. Was the Apostle Paul a, a messenger of God? Boy, I hope so. He wrote most of the New Testament. What about Luke? Luke was not, not formally an apostle, but he was associated with the, the apostles. He was in that circle. And so the messenger of this book, Acts, is established in some way as connected to the Christian community. Now, a lot of times when a message comes from God, it is accompanied by miracles. You know, something that is objective and really, truly amazing. Okay? Now, if I pull a rabbit out of a hat, that's not quite a miracle. That's a trick, right? Anybody have a rabbit in a hat? No. No, okay, no rabbits in hats today. That's a trick, but a miracle is something done by one of these messengers of God, and it's done in service to the message. It always comes back to validating what God says in the ancient world. And then the other, one of the other criterion would be acceptance by the community of faith so that it's not just launched into the, into the world, it's accepted by the community of faith. And the Jewish community was known for not accepting new ideas. And so our challenge here, uh, the Bible is God's message, it's durable, it's reliable, and our challenge is to interpret the message, just like the first wildebeest. He's got the message, it's an alligator. And he's trying to say, just share the message with one more wildebeest. Hey, dude, be careful. It's an alligator. Don't mess with the alligator. Well, as we've talked about the book of Acts, we've talked about the whole meta narrative of Scripture, all of the different things that the Bible is communicating. It starts with the creation. Who created everything? God. Yeah, God created everything. And so who messed it up? Satan. Uh, both. Satan, man, fall, all that sort of wrapped up together. Humankind misused the good free will that God gave us in order to fall into sin. And that affected the entire creation so that the creation is now, the world we live in is characterized by brokenness. I hope that's not new for you. you know, as I look around, I know all of you have experienced brokenness in one way or another. And so the world is characterized by brokenness. But there's hope. That God would send someone to redeem us. That God would send a rescuer. That rescuer is Jesus Christ. And the rescue he effected for us is to free us from the consequence, well not all the consequences, but to free us from the eternal consequences of the fall. You see, a fallen humanity is destined for, to perish. But a redeemed humanity, a humanity that trusts in what God has provided in Jesus Christ, can live with God forever, eternally. We will one day transfer to the heavenly UB church, which is really, really close to the front. <laughs> really, really close to the throne. I believe it. And so the book of Acts is about the proclamation of God's new work through Jesus. It's the birth of a new movement of God based on the historical fact of the resurrection. It's about the person and the teaching of Jesus of Nazareth. Now, other ancient religions, just about every other religion you can compare, 
is based on the teaching of a great teacher. Now, Jesus was the greatest teacher, but we don't believe just in the teachings of Jesus. We believe in the person of Jesus Christ, who he is as the Son of God. That's very important. It's a very important distinction. If you take the teachings of Buddha and you remove the Buddha, you still have Buddhism. If you take the teachings of Christianity and remove the person of Jesus Christ, you have nothing. And so that's what we're talking about. As we think about this new movement of God, it's about the person of Jesus. And the faith of Christians is in who he is. Now we're talking about uh, th this next part of chapter 13 is going to be where the Apostle Paul is going to continue the preaching in a new location. And it establishes continuity between Peter's preaching in Acts 2 and 4 and 10. Peter has preached before, and so Paul preaches a very, very similar message. And so as I preach to you, I'm going to try and do it a little bit differently. So it could be fun, or it could be a train wreck, and my mom is watching. So. <laughs> and so the key similarity is in both of these messages... As Peter preaches, as Philip preaches, as everybody preaches, it all comes back down to the resurrection. It comes back to the fact that God raised Jesus from the dead. Amen. That is, that's the central idea. That's the central truth, the big fact of Christianity. And so look, look with me, if you would, please, in Acts chapter 13. We'll start in, in verse 13. Because Luke is repeating, or Paul is repeating the message in a place called Pisidian Antioch, to demonstrate continuity between the apostolic preaching as the message spreads across racial and economic boundaries. It's the same gospel for everyone, everywhere. And so Paul is going to preach the resurrection here in, or in Pisidian Antioch. Verse 13 says this. From Paphos, Paphos, Paul and his companions sailed to Perga in Pamphylia, where John left them to return to Jerusalem. From Perga they went on to Pisidian Antioch. On the Sabbath they entered the synagogue and sat down. After the reading from the law and the prophets, the leaders of the synagogue sent word to them, saying, Brothers, if you have any word of exhortation for the people, please speak. Standing up, Paul motioned with his hand and said, Fellow Israelites and you Gentiles who worship God, listen to me. The God of the people of Israel chose our ancestors. He made the people prosper during their stay in Egypt, with mighty power, he led them out of that country. For about 40 years, he endured their conduct in the wilderness. And he overthrew seven nations in Canaan, giving their land to his people as their inheritance. All this took about 450 years. After this, God gave them judges until the time of Samuel the prophet. Then the people asked for a king, and they gave them Saul, son of Kish, of the tribe of Benjamin, who ruled for 40 years. After removing Saul, he made David their king. God testified concerning him, I have found David, son of Jesse, a man after my own heart. He will do everything I want him to do. From this man's descendants, God has brought to Israel the Savior Jesus as he promised. Before the coming of Jesus, John preached repentance and baptism to all the people of Israel. As John was completing his work, he said, Who do you suppose I am? I am not the one you are looking for. But there is one coming after me whose sandals I am not worthy to untie. And so God is acting on behalf of his people Israel. And so Ruthann, I'm going to have to enlist your assistance if you don't mind. Sure. Would you please hand me the first box? Are the people on my seat? What? Seat. Yeah, I'll make sure that... Mom? Okay. <laughs> now I did not put God in this box. Okay, but I, I want you to understand that the foundation of all this idea is God. Okay, and so God is the one who start. He's the one who chose the people of Israel. Second box. Israel, right? And so on the foundation, God's the one doing the choosing. God's the one doing the starting. Third box. The people go down to Egypt where they're stuck in the Egyptian slavery, right? You remember that whole story, the whole Moses thing? And then God brings them out and puts them into the land. Now, if you're going to have a nation, if you go back to Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 through 3, God makes certain promises to, Israel, to Abraham. He says, I'm going to make you a great nation, and I'm going to give you this land, and you're going to be a blessing to many people. 
Well, here we are. The people of Israel have become numerous. Now they live in the land. Now, what do a crowd of people living in a land need? Food. Food, yeah. Food, yeah. What else? Government. They need government. Who's going to run this place? Who's going to make sure that people do as they're supposed to do? Okay, so God's going to give judges. Oh, good. <coughs> judges. But the people weren't satisfied with judges. And so as the text goes through here, God chose the people of Israel. God prospered them in Egypt and then led them out. God endured their bad conduct in the wilderness. He overthrew the Canaanite nations. And with the people in the land, they need leadership. And so he gave them good judges. And what did they say? We'd like a king, please. And so he starts with King Saul. I didn't want my stack to get too high. So just imagine there's another box there. <laughs> He starts with King Saul. Now Saul looked like a king. He was very tall. I, I, he was very tall. You know, maybe he drank his tea with his finger out. I don't know. Okay. He looked the part of a king, but he was horrible. And so God gave them his choice of a king who didn't look like a very good king, but he did act like a king. And so then uh, the text says Jesus first. Okay. But then John remembers, or I'm sorry, Luke remembers, that he's going to need John, right? Because if you're going to have a king, he's got to be announced by a prophet. Just like King David was announced by the prophet Samuel, you're going to have to have a prophet so that you can get all the way up to King Jesus. And through all of this, what Paul, or what Paul is preaching about, he says, look, there was prophecy. So through all of this, you have the prophecies of God that come through and there's indications of what's coming next. Precarious, precarious, King David. And some of the big prophecies about David is that God's going to send a new David. God's going to send a new king to lead the people into prosperity. And so all of these prophecies lead all the way up to Jesus as the king. That's a pretty impressive stack of boxes, right? Through all of this, the prophetic word, God promised, God promised, God promised. And when God promises, what does he do, folks? He delivers. If God writes you a check, you don't need to call the bank. You just go. It's good. And so Paul's audience, as Paul is preaching to Jewish people, they're saying, yes, God chose our ancestors. They were in Egypt. Yes, he led them to the land. Yes, oh yeah, there were judges. King David... Oh, this is the promised king? So if there's a prophetic word that establishes a new work of God, what do you have to have, church? You better have a miracle to back it up. What's the miracle? The resurrection. The resurrection. See, we've got the prophetic word all the way through, and then we've got the resurrection. What are you supposed to see? Jesus was promised by God. He was rejected and executed by men only to be resurrected by the power of God. What are you supposed to do with the message of God? Believe it. Like the initial move is to say, okay, uh, if this is established by prophecy, proven by miracle, the response of the community of faith is to be yes, Lord. To receive it and to obey it. What did they do? What did the Jewish people do when they first saw all of this? No thanks. They rejected God's plan, walked away from it, and what they did is they crucified, now I'm going to find Jesus again, they crucified the king. And so you know what God did, right? He says, nope, can't do it. I'm going to bring him back. And so now you have this, this message that is being spread around the ancient world that Jesus is the king promised by God, established by prophecy, resurrected from the dead. And so the Jewish people have rejected it. 
Well, what happens then? Now what? Hmm. The point is here that the Jesus was sent by God, announced by the prophetic community, all the way to John the Baptist. And so this little illustration here is when God sends a savior and a king, what are you supposed to do? You bow before him. Especially if it's established by the prophetic word. If it's proven by a miracle, a resurrection, you bow before him. You thank him for what he's done for you. And the second is that you obey him. I was able to go this week and, uh, and speak to the kids at the local Bible college. And I, um, I wanted to poke them a little bit, but I also wanted to use them as a research sample. In this room, there were 60 or 70 millennials who are obviously interested in spreading the news about Jesus. And so I, I thought, okay, how well are they doing it? And so I started with a series of limiting questions. And I, I believe in you know, having a little bit of skin in the game. So I put a $20 bill on the, on the podium and I said, okay, let's ask these limiting questions. How many of you went to church? You know, and that took the room of 60 down to about, or 70 down to about 65. It's like, okay, maybe you were sick or whatever. And so from that 65, I said, how many of you, that's your regular church that you go every week? And that took 65 down to 55. And here's where I knew I was going to catch them. How many of you who've been attending that church regularly have made a formal commitment, like a student membership or an associate membership, to that church? We went from 55 to 10. And so I said, out of you 10, how many of you have shared the gospel with somebody, the message about Jesus Christ, the King, with someone else, and have you integrated them into the community of the local church? There was one. And so I gave her 20 bucks. And I said, thank you for your service. Keep doing it. You are doing what God has called you to do. If I had a job opening, I would ask her if she could come interview for us. Because she's a lay person who's doing the work she's supposed to be doing. I was happy to lose 20 bucks to make this point. I told the students, I said, I wish you made me go to the ATM. I wouldn't have been able to go to the ATM. <laughs> but I can say that to them. You know, this is, and so we discussed it. I, I told them, I said, look, I, I don't want to, I'm not just here to poke you. I'm here to find out what's going on. Because we as a church, we have to reach millennials. They're weird. <laughs> Nothing personal to those of you who are millennials. I could pretend because nobody can see the audience. To those of you who are millennials. <laughs> and now they have to guess how many there are. It's difficult. It's a problem. And if those folks, if that group of 70 young people is having a hard time reaching into their own community, how much harder is it for us? And so I said, let's explore this question. I, I broke them up into groups. And I said, you talk, find out a reason, help me understand how I as a pastor can encourage my congregation, how I as a, as a Christian can reach out to millennials. They came up with some very honest answers. They said, you know, it's really hard to talk to people about religious ideas. I said, that's true. It really is hard to reach across the, the culture. It's not as open to discussing these kind of things as we'd like. And then one of the students said, you know what? It really doesn't matter how difficult it is. It matters that we do it. And I was like, man, that's right. It matters that we just do it. Our culture has changed. But our mandate as Christians, just like Paul preached all of this to, to people, we have the same thing. We have the same idea that God made Jesus the king. And we have the same idea to spread around. And so Paul preaches this historical continuity, this work of God all the way back to Abraham, all the way up to Jesus. And so Paul preaches this to these folks. There's continuity between God's work. And so in the second point, there's the ongoing significance of the resurrection. Take a look at verse 32. Oh man, I got to John 20. I don't know how that happened. Take a look at verse 32 in chapter 13. 
We tell you the good news, what God promised our ancestors, he has fulfilled for us, their children, by raising up Jesus. As it is written in the second psalm, you are my son. Today I have become your father. God raised him from the dead so that he will never be subject to decay. As God has said, I will give you the holy and sure blessings promised to David. So it is also stated elsewhere, you will not let your holy one see decay. Now, when David had served God's purpose in his own generation, he fell asleep. That means he died. He was buried with his ancestors and his body decayed. But the one whom God raised from the dead did not see decay. Therefore, my friends, I want you to know that through Jesus, the forgiveness of sins is proclaimed to you. Through him, everyone who believes is set free from every sin, a justification you were not able to obtain under the law of Moses. Take care that what the prophets have said does not happen to you. Look, you scoffers, wonder and perish, for I am going to do something in your days that you would never believe, even if someone told you. You see, what happens here is that Paul goes through and he says, look, this has been prophesied. There's prophecy just all over the idea that Jesus is the king. And please don't steal the royal jewels. <laughs> Jesus is the king. And so Luke consistently grounds Jesus' story in the story of ancient Israel. And Jesus is the proper and right climax. The final act of God. The point. Jesus is the answer to prophecy. And so Paul just picks up these two boxes. And he says, you, you, the Jews in Jerusalem have knocked this down. But we know that God sent Jesus to be the king. And so Jesus is the answer to prophecy. And what Paul does, he combines several Old Testament texts who were known for uh, their expectation of the coming Messiah, the coming king. And so the Jewish people expected this greater king than David. There would be no decay for this king, no death, an eternal kingdom. And you know, as I thought about that, I, I, I try to stay away uh, too, too much from politics. Because I know we all have different political opinions, and, and there are good reasons behind them. Um, wouldn't it be great if we had a divine government, a government led by Jesus Christ, who's obligated to tell us the truth? Wouldn't we like a little more transparency? Wouldn't we like a little bit more goodness and wholeness and wholesomeness in our government? I know I would. And can you imagine all the money we'd save on national defense if God was running the country? <laughs> Can you imagine, like for me, uh, she has a small business, and so I think about the burden of taxation. I'd like a little relief. And I think God could pull that off. Yeah. Right? Wouldn't we love that kind of government? And so the kingship of Jesus, a perfect kingdom, a perfect king. And so not only is Jesus the perfect king, and by the way, he does rule over us as believers. He rules a spiritual kingdom of us. And the better we model that kingdom, the better we are doing what God wants us to do. The better we are following after Jesus, not just in our personal morality, but also in our relationships with one another. We model the kingdom. That's hard. It's hard to do, but it's worth doing. And so Jesus also provides a forgiveness for sin that the sacrificial system could not provide. In the Old Testament, you had the Jewish sacrificial system where animals were brought uh, daily, weekly, monthly. There was uh, an annual calendar where over and over and over again, animals were sacrificed as a payment for sin. And they would never fully satisfy. But what Jesus did is he offered himself on the cross. And his death is so far superior that that one death pays for all of our sin. That's an incredible idea. And so Jesus came to provide this new relationship to God by replacing a system that was always intended to be temporary. Jesus made one sacrifice that provides forgiveness for all who believe. And so Paul is breaking down this idea and saying, this is the idea. Let me illustrate this this way. And there was once a king who had suffered much from his rebellious subjects. But one day they surrendered their arms, 
threw him threw themselves at his feet and begged for mercy. He pardoned them all. And one of his friends said to him, Did you not say that every rebel should die? And he replied, Yes, but I see no rebels here. That's what God did. We were in rebellion against him, but through Jesus we come to him with forgiveness. And by that forgiveness, God says, I see no rebels here. So man, scrub out anything rebellious in your life and heart. You were once a rebel, but no longer. Even more than an earthly king, God views everyone who believes in Jesus as his child. You are God's child. What an incredible idea to walk around as the child of God. Therefore, and this is where Paul brings up the therefore. He says, look, this is true. I saw him. I know this. And so don't reject it. Don't walk away from it. And this applies to everyone. Don't reject it. Don't walk away from it. You know, this is the idea. If you haven't, I think looking around, I see I know all of you are, are Christians already, but if you're watching through Facebook and you haven't come to Christ yet, if you haven't made a decision to believe in Jesus, now's your chance. Now's your chance. Amen. And so Luke is writing here an apologetic history. And, and Paul and Barnabas get invited back. They do a good job speaking one week. They say, come back next week and we'll hear more about it. And so Luke is writing an apologetic history. He's giving good reasons why people in the first century should become followers of Jesus Christ. You see, the coming of Jesus Christ was prophesied in the Old Testament. Valid messengers of God indicated that he would send a new deliverer, a new king. And then there's this forgiveness of sins that makes us God's children. And it's open to everyone. Pisidian Antioch was populated by retired soldiers. Uh, there were all kinds of different gods in the area. There were all kinds of different beliefs. And all of them were invited to come in through the gospel. You know, as we've talked about this, this idea, um, what I've suggested is the, the beginning of helping people come to Jesus is just starting conversations. Just having a conversation with somebody new. And whenever I challenge you with something like that, I challenge myself. You know having conversations with people is difficult for me. And so this week I decided, okay, if I'm going to challenge you, I'm going to have to pull it off. I had a phone conversation with a good friend who said uh, he, he, was, he started a business with Edward Jones as a financial advisor. And they required that he contact, he have 25 meaningful contacts every day. And a meaningful contact for a financial advisor is that you found out someone's name, someone's contact information, and something relevant about their finances. So you would have to find out that they had X number of dollars in a retirement account. 25 people a day. Can you imagine? And then he would have to go and report to his supervisors, how many people did you meet today? This is why I can't be that guy. Right? He had to meet 25. Can you imagine what would happen if all those kids at New Tribes met 25 people a day? Can you imagine if we did that? That's 2,500 people a week. Can you imagine if the churches in Jackson just contacted 2,500 people a week? That'd be incredible. That'd be, uh, that might be revolutionary. That's how you grow a business. You just have to keep making new contacts. And so it's the same for the church. We have to keep making new contacts. I, I, you know, I'll be honest with you, I, I struggle with this. And so this week I bought some stuff at, at Office Max, and I love in-store pickup. I buy it online, I walk in the store, I don't talk to anybody, I walk out with my stuff, right? And so I'm standing in line because I have to sign papers or whatever, and this gentleman pulls up behind me and I'm like, I gotta say hello. And so it was nasty weather, and so I said, hey, what do you think of all this global warming stacking up all, all around us outside? And he chuckled, he said, that's pretty good. And then he said, I predict by the end of February, we're going to see spring. And I said, man, you preach it and I'll turn the pages. <laughs> and so he says to me, you sound like you go to church. Now, folks, I, I've got enough Pathway t-shirts that I wear a Pathway t-shirt almost every day of my life. And so I was wearing my jacket, and I zipped down my jacket, <laughs> <laughs> and he says, I've been wanting to meet you. <laughs> and I did not invite him to church. On purpose. 
because he was Pastor James Hines of the Lily Missionary Baptist Church here in Jackson. I said, Lord, come on, I'm trying to meet people here. But you know, you know what my friend tells me about that, that 25 people? Because you can imagine how hard it is to ask somebody, so how much money do you have? And it's easy for me. I, I don't know. Ask her. <laughs> Finances is a, is a touchy subject. You know what he said? After he got accustomed to doing that over and over and over again, it's not hard. It's not hard. It becomes natural. And the same thing's true about sharing the gospel. It becomes natural. Because this is just, it's just true. It's just true. It's established by prophecy. It's a historical fact. And so I think the historical fact of the resurrection is one of the most powerful ideas you can ever share with somebody. And when they say, well, I don't believe it, show them the video with the wildebeest and the alligator. <laughs> Look, I'm telling you, it's in the Bible for a reason, because it happened. It's what, how do you believe in George Washington? Because he's on dollar bills, right? <laughs> he's a historical figure. Well, you can't scientifically prove George Washington. I guess you could probably dig him up and test his DNA, but it's a historical question. This is history. And so all we have to do is just keep sharing history. And you know what? Don't be surprised when people try to obfuscate or, or dodge or duck or whatever, because that happens too. And so Paul, he just constantly made new contacts to share the message about Jesus. And that brings controversy. Take a look at verse 44. Because the results of preaching the resurrection, it's not always sunshine and lollipops. Verse 44 says this, On the next Sabbath, almost the whole city gathered to hear the word of the Lord. When the Jews saw the crowds, they were filled with jealousy. They began to contradict what Paul was saying and heaped abuse on him. Then Paul and Barnabas answered them boldly, We had to speak the word of God to you first. Since you reject it and do not consider yourselves worthy of eternal life, we now turn to the Gentiles. For this is what the Lord has commanded us. I have made you a light for the Gentiles, that you may bring salvation to the ends of the earth. When the Gentiles heard this, they were glad and honored the word of the Lord, and all who were appointed for eternal life believed. The word of the Lord spread through the whole region, but the Jewish leaders incited the God-fearing women of high standing and the leading men of the city. They stirred up persecution against Paul and Barnabas and expelled them from their region. So they shook the dust off their feet as a warning to them and went to Iconium. And the disciples were filled with joy and with the Holy Spirit. You know why they were filled with joy and the Holy Spirit? Because a new church got born. Because people believe this, they're going to live forever. But what's happening is that the Jewish people are like, you know, that's not really. Gee, you know, there's nothing to see here. Yeah, we're just going to. We're just going to cover this up here. You don't, you don't need to worry about all that. Yeah. Okay. Now everybody just go back about your business. Well, that's horrible. See, this is the greatest fact of human history. This is the true thing that causes us to live an eternal life with God Amen. in heaven. Amen. Amen. And it's just got to be said. It can't be covered up. It can't be covered up by my my hesitance to meet new people. It's got to be proclaimed from the rooftops. It's got to be sung loudly. And you see, as these people turned out, you know, the, what would it look like for the whole city to turn out to hear this message? Why? Because people got excited about it. Because people accepted the reality of this message and they said, everyone needs to know this. So there's a new church born in the city of Antioch. And even though there are new believers, there's also a new controversy. The Jews are jealous. The believers just couldn't stop talking about it. So the Jews tried to hide it. And there's always a bad response. There's jealousy. There's rejection. There's opposition. And you notice how the Jewish people, they said, let's find the leading ladies of the city and let's get them to be involved in this cover-up. And let's talk to the leading men of the city. And, oh, yeah, let's exercise all this political influence. Let's persecute Saul, Paul, and Barnabas because they obviously, they're rabble-rousers. They're just telling the truth. And so the Jewish people just want to cover it up. There's lots of people in the world today that just want to cover it up. They want to close their eyes to the truth. They want to just be blind. They want to create their own little Jesus. I'm going to follow this Jesus because he just doesn't have any rules for me. Doesn't have any requirements for me. 
It doesn't cost me any money. There's no skin in the game. That's not Jesus. That's a little fake Jesus. Right? You can't follow a fake Jesus. you got to follow the real Jesus. And so in this city, there's also this good response. There's belief in Christ. There's joy. There's the power of the Holy Spirit. And because those people in Pisidian Antioch believe, that's why we're here. Because somebody bothered to send the message. Somebody bothered. And you know, that's why we as a church here, we can expect the split response. We can expect persecution. We can expect cover-up. That's how church has happened through all of human history. There's always going to be controversy. And so when we think about God, raised Jesus from the dead, he is the promised deliverer and king. And his current rule, his current rule, he is our king. His future reign will be over everyone, where every knee will bow before him and everyone will know the truth. And he will rule with perfect justice. And there won't be anyone who can cover it up. But until that day, until that day, we're like the wildebeest that goes, hey, look at that. That's amazing. We have to prove it. We didn't have to be good at it. We just have to do it. And for me, as I thought about this, I thought, you know, the Apostle Paul, he knows that God raised Jesus from the dead to provide an everlasting king, to provide forgiveness of sins to all who believe. And these Jewish people still reject it. There are still some people who look at the alligator and think it's a lock. There are still some people who reject the truth about Jesus. And, you know, I, I challenge those people at the Bible college. I said, look, if you want to be in professional ministry, you're going to have to be in professional ministry before you have a job there. You're going to have to do what you're called to do for free. And so I challenged them with that. And I was happy to give that lady 20 bucks, that young lady. And I think that meeting with them just illustrates how hard it is for us in our community. But we don't have to prove it. We just have to be faithful to it. And, you know, as I, thought, as I think about this idea, I think about this as a concept. I can just be comfortable knowing that it's true. I can just accept the truth of it and just bask in it for a minute. That my God, your God, sent Jesus to be our king. And as we, as we are in that kingdom already, man, what an opportunity just to be brothers and sisters. What an opportunity just to demonstrate his love. What a comfort it is to know that this is true. It's just established. It's so true you can just take it to the bank. It's even more true than that. Is the sun going to rise tomorrow? That's how true this is. It is. Now, whether we can see it or not, that's a different story because it is much more. It's just true. And so, folks, all we have to do is just be that will the beast. That's all we have to do. And so I think, uh, I feel like we've come back to this idea many different times. But just take comfort in the truth of this. Just bask in that. And then as you rub shoulders with people during the week, as you rub shoulders with people all the time, it's going to come out. It can't not. As the team comes up and as, uh, as the guys get ready for the offering, let's just pray together. Lord God, I thank you so much. I thank you for history. I thank you for the truth of history, Lord. And I thank you that... I don't have to manufacture good arguments. The only argument is what you've given us, Lord, that Jesus has been raised from the dead. And all we have to do is say there's got to be an explanation for that. It's got to be that the power of God raised him from the dead. And that leads me to just more questions. What do I do? And my first move, Lord, is to bow and to serve him as best I can in all of my human weakness, Lord, in all of our human weakness, Father, that we just bow before you, desire to follow you, Desire to do what's right. And then, Father, just help us to be uh, just a simple messenger for a simple message. A simple, powerful, incredible truth that you raised Jesus to be our King and to offer us forgiveness of sins. And so, Lord, help us to walk in that today. I thank you, Father, for the offering, and I pray, Lord, you'd help it to, uh, to meet our needs, Lord. And just thank you in Christ's name. Amen.